Um, I got two names to add to it. Um, we added this name last week, but I want to remind you of Rhonda. This is a dear friend of the Manasiacs with a brain tumor, a relatively young person, so keep Rhonda in your prayers. And I got a, a, a note from Nancy, uh, her sister Marilyn. Um, she is recovering from knee replacement surgery, and uh, unfortunately there's some complications with fluid on her lungs, which is the predecessor, I think, to, to pneumonia, and so they want to keep that on top of. So just keep... Um, Marilyn, in your prayers. Again, uh, I'm not trying to slide anyone. If you have information or someone that we need to be praying for, just let us know. Uh, we're honored to have that opportunity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite you to pray with me just a moment. Pray silently. Those at home, pray silently, and then I'll close. So let's pray together. Father, again, thank you for the privilege of communicating to you in prayer. To be able to stop anywhere, to, even as we're driving, just to, as our eyes are open, to uh, talk and communicate to our Heavenly Father. What a great, great, well, it's a privilege. It's an awesome responsibility as well. We place in your care the names of people we've mentioned, family members, friends, individuals that are going through heartache, difficulty. We certainly... We're heavy of heart for Kathy and the situation that she's facing. There's that part of us as a Jesus follower that rejoices because she's enter, entering into her eternal home. And, but there's that part of us that are human that we miss her. And we certainly feel that sadness for John. And then, of course, there's the Bessett family that lost um, a very valuable component, a very key member to their family. And I know that Lori and her family is, is struggles with this because it seems like death seems to be so frequent. God, you're a great and awesome God. And we ultimately think, we, we claim that you know what's best for us. And even though sometimes we can't see it, we know that we, we're going to trust that you have our agenda, the, the game plan for our lives and for the things that we need to accomplish in sight, in your sight, constantly. So we just are going to trust you again that what's happening is happening for a reason. And... Uh, ultimately, that reason is to bring you glory. We praise you and we thank you for who you are and what you do. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ, who's Lord and Savior. Amen. If this works. Okay. Um. This... Uh, what I want to talk about today is uh, directed more to the body of Christ. Um, if you're here today or you're watching online and you're not quite sure of your role in your faith with Jesus, then what I'm going to say might be, it's a little too loud, Jeff, it's I'm getting ringing, it, it might be, um, you're, you're just going to kind of observe and, and pay attention to. But for those of you that claim to be a Jesus follower, um, I want to talk, talk more directly to you especially if you're affiliated with our church here at Lincoln Street Christian Church. But even if you're not, if it's a Jesus follower, I, I hope that you'll kind of keep this in the context of the body that you worship with, that you, you participate in. If I were to go through this room and I were to ask you, what is your favorite verse, I, your Bible verse, I think it would probably be an, a rewarding and a re enriching Sunday just to do that sometime, just to say, you know, take a microphone and just walk through the crowd and tell me what is the most important Bible verse that you have. Because if anything I've learned about, you know, people and scripture and the power of scripture is that it resonates. Different verses resonate in the lives of people for different reasons. Now, some of you might say, oh, yeah, yeah, John 3, 16, that's my go-to verse. And it's a great one. For some of you, it's, it's, it's the, the shepherd's psalm, Psalm 23. 
Or maybe it's the Lord's Prayer, or the Beatitudes. Or if you go a little further into Paul's letters, you're just moved by his description of love in 1 Corinthians 13, or his description of the fruit of the Spirit, or the, the body of armor you know, the, the, in Ephesians. It, for all of us, it would be different, and it would be fascinating to know not just what your favorite verse or verses are, and I'm not saying you have to have them memorized, but why they're your favorites. You know, this is the verse my mama taught me, my dad. This, is a, this verse helped me through a very important time in my life. And, and the cool thing about Scripture is it may not have been from your childhood. It may have just been from a three days ago. And this verse has spoken to you since then, and it's just powerful, and it continues to move you. I find that fascinating. But the verse that I want to launch our discussion in today is probably not many of your favorites, though I would say most of you have heard this verse, at least a portion of it. In the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus is talking, it's one of those really... I, it, John just has some really interesting sermons, lessons that Jesus taught. And in the 10th chapter, he's referring to uh, the shepherd being uh, watching the sheep, and he talks about being the gate and people getting into the pen. And it, if, if you get a chance, read it later today or this week. And in the, the 11th verse, he makes that bold statement. He says, I am the good shepherd. And of course, we are his sheep. But the verse that's interesting to me is... The verse before that, John 10.10. 10. You, you have that on the screen for me? He says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That part you may not remember. But this next part, you, you've probably heard a few times. He says, I have come that they may have life. And life to the full. I have come that they may have life. And life to the full. Now, if you really want to know what Jesus is about, there are a few key verses that really depict that. For example, John 3.16 gives us the reason that God sent his son. That's, that's a go-to verse, for God so loved the world, he gave. And there's another great verse, and it's, it's found in several different locations where Jesus is talking about the nature of his ministry, and he says, I have come to serve, not to be served. And of course, that is an awesome, in the context each time it's given, that's an awesome, awesome principle of Jesus in his ministry. But I want to suggest that John 10.10 10 is kind of an explanation for his entire purpose for his ministry. I have come that they may have life, life to the fullest, life to the extreme. Now, I don't know about you, but maybe it's because of the nature of my employment, but when someone finds out I'm a minister, and that's sometimes why I don't tell people I'm a minister, I usually get into these kinds of conversations, not all the time, but oftentimes with people that are strangers, they'll say something like, oh, I just love Jesus, you know, or as the Doobie Brothers would say, Jesus is just all right with me. Um, it's a good day when you can include a Doobie Brothers song in the sermon. You know, <clears throat> anyway, Jesus is just all right, but church, eh, I'm against that. Or they'll say something, well, yeah, Jesus, uh, Jesus is fine, Jesus is cool, man, Jesus is the man, but organized religion, I'm against. I'm not for that. And I've learned over time that the response that I make in order to keep the conversation going <laughs> is that I say, well, you know, it's interesting, Jesus was against organized religion too, at least the one that was going on in his time. Jesus is about a lifestyle. And that's what I hope we're about, a lifestyle. Not necessarily an organized faith, because Jesus isn't saying that I've come so that you can have a philosophy to discuss. He didn't say I've come that you might have a, a religion to conform to. He didn't even say I have come that you can have an institution to maintain. He says I have come that you might have life, and life to the fullest. Now, here's my proposition to Jesus followers. I'm talking to you primarily. If this is the purpose of Christ, I, I know it's involved with his salvation and the cross and a bunch of other in, in, uh, stuff, but if this was his purpose so that we might have life, shouldn't that also be the purpose of the church? That we should be about helping people find life and life to the fullest. Now stop and think about this. Here's the truth. There are a lot of people who are living life, but not to the fullest. There are a lot of Jesus followers. They're, they're living full lives. They're busy lives. But there's a huge difference between being busy and having a full life. 
and having a fulfilling life. And I, I, I think sometimes as the church, we tend to be more interested in busy, keep the calendar busy, and not so much on fulfilling. And I'm just as guilty sometimes of that. So in the process of thinking this through, I, I thought, well, you know what? Let's sit down. How do I, how do you and I, how together, how do we as a family presenting it to a community of people in, the, in, in our various locations, how do we have a fulfilling life? And then I thought, well, it, it might be if we understand the nature of five fundamental emotional needs that I think everyone needs to have. Now, it's interesting. We have some very trained counselors in our group this morning. I see John and Diana, and you guys, you can double-check my work later on today. This is stuff that I've read about. This is stuff that I've observed. This is stuff that I've seen. And so we may not all agree on the terminology, but just bear with me. And if you want to track and write this down, I'd encourage you to do so, even though I'll, I'll try to have my printer up and running next Sunday so you can have this in print. There are five fundamental emotional needs that I just want to address quickly, and then we'll talk in greater depth about that. The first one, of course, is just salvation. Now, this is probably where we separate from a lot of people in the world, they don't see salvation as important. But for me, as a Jesus follower, I don't think anyone's going to have a fulfilling life until they have Jesus in their life. But listen to me, having Jesus in your life is not all there is. It's not, that's not enough. I mean, that sounded bad theology. It is enough, but let me rephrase that. You're not going to achieve fulfilling just because you're a Jesus follower. It's a huge beginning, and it's a necessary beginning. But you also need the other four emotional needs. And I, the, the, the second one that I want to touch on is the need for support. By the way, they all begin with the letter S, so you can remember them. Salvation, support. I'll come back to that one. The third one is stability. Stability. The world that you and I live in is constantly changing. When people don't feel stable, they are insecure. And you probably agree with me, I think you would, that today there's a lot of insecurity in our world. It's a huge amount of insecurity. There's a huge amount of instability in society right now. Whether it's a virus or whether it's cultural values that are changing or being changed. I mean, the old support systems are going by the wayside. Just as simple as 60 years ago. Maybe even 50 years ago. Um, within my lifetime. Um, you know, you, you were raised in a, in, a, in a neighborhood. And we've talked about this before, many of us, you know, you know. Your mom and dad were your primary caregivers, but every mom and dad in the neighborhood was also a participant in that. And so if you were playing across the street, they would just as well reprimand you or, or you know, it was, that was the kind of nature. It was a community. And whether it was in an urban setting or whether it was in a rural setting, you know, there was a small community. So you had the family. The family was a lot stronger. It was a lot closer. Uh, your church, if you attended church, and many of you probably remember that back in 50 years ago, almost everyone did, you know, your church family, and everything was pretty d decided. Well, today, it's a completely different world. The average American is going to move somewhere between 11 and 16 times in their lifetime. They average, they say 16 times because we average, to, uh, this is just an average, we move every five years. Every five years we move. Now I know some of you are going, I'm in the same house I was raised in. That's, that's, you're the exception, <laughs> not the rule. And praise God for that, though I'm sure by now that house needs siding and a new roof. But the deal is, uh, it's amazing, that's not the norm anymore. Not to mention the fact that not only do we move so much, we have neighbors and quite frankly, we don't want to know who they are. Now again, for those of you that have been in the same home, you probably know all your neighbors and they know you. But for most of us who have moved frequently, uh, we don't have that privilege. And that's why we have these huge backyards with these tall privacy fences. Because all the living's back there now and it's not on the porch in the front of the house anymore. So that's not the case. It's back there in private. So stability is a big thing. Uh, the fourth S is, and this is a little unusual, but it's the need for self-expression. The need for self-expression. God has made every single person unique with unique abilities, unique talents, unique gifts, unique experiences. I mean, you've heard this before, but it's true. You know, just like there's no two snowflakes, there's no two people. Even twins have different things. Parents, you can attest this. Those of you that have had children and you've had multiple children, same mom, 
most case, same dad, same circumstances, and yet you'll have two children that are completely different. One's a slob, one's a neat freak. One's a control thing, one takes lists, the other one lives by the seat of his pants or the seat of her pants. I mean, they're just vastly different because they're hardwired that way. Um, when we did the Purpose Driven Church, which was several years ago, a lesson series from Saddleback, Rick Warren uh, and the Saddleback Community Church, they offer uh, kind of a unique description of the way individuals are made. They call it the shape, S-H-A-P-E. Some of you may remember that acrostic. Each one of those stands for something. The S stands for your spiritual gift mix, because everyone here is a Jesus follower, you've got spiritual gifts. The H stands for your heart, your passion. What, what you're passionate about. The A stands for your abilities, you know? What are you capable of doing? Some of you are really good at your hands, doing things with your hands, and then some of you are like me. <laughs> It's not my gift, it's not my abilities. Uh, P stands for personality. I think it's fascinating because I, I tend to follow the four-step traditional kind of personality thing, but there are so many tools out there to help you determine your personality. But we're learning that personality is in-wired, it's, it's hardwired. Uh, I have two grandsons, the same, I mean, uh, Eli's this way and Ezra is the other way, and you know, they're opposite as could be. That's a nice way of saying that my daughter decided to name her children after Bible characters, and we really thought Lucifer would be a good name for that guy. <laughs> and I hope you're watching, honey. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, they're just different. Uh, and, they're di and the E stands for experiences. Experiences, your experiences. I've told you before, and I believe with all my heart, God doesn't waste experiences. But all that just means that, you know, you're, you're made different, and you express yourself different. Now, now let's just take a moment and talk about church. Um, for the last 200 years, um, church is pretty well developed into, a, we, we do a sing thing, a song thing, a music thing, a praise thing. And in our church tradition, we have communion and offering, and, and then we have a teaching thing. And I, I know a lot of individuals who love Jesus, who love the church, but they're not in the singing thing, and they can't sit still for 30 minutes. They can't sit still for 15 minutes, so the teaching thing doesn't really strike them at all. But unfortunately, we're not providing an opportunity for their self-expression because we've kind of narrowed ourselves in and channeled it and said, this is what you can do. 25 years ago, I was at Willow Creek Community Church, Willow Creek Community Church and they did something I had never seen before. They did something called expressive dance. During the worship service, a bunch of individuals got across the stage and they danced to interpret to a psalm. Now, it, it's not in my wheelhouse. It, it's not in my comfort zone. I thought it was the goofiest thing I'd ever seen. And then something came out called Circle Soleil and everybody started to see all these dance moves and they were put to music and they're awesome and they're incredible. Well, my point is, is there are people within the body of Christ that speaks to that communicates the love of God to. That's their opportunity to express their love physically, physically with their body. Uh, Tina, as a teacher, knows, and I'm picking on Tina as the educator here, there are different styles of education. Kids learn differently. Some kids learn by just lecture. Some kids have kinetic. They've got to touch things. They've got to play with things. We're all different. That's the point. Within the body of Christ, we need to recognize that there are different ways to self-express your worship to God. Some people need drama. Some people do need music. I'm not trying to pick on Marilyn, but I don't think Marilyn feels like she's been to church unless she's played the piano. And I'll tell you what, I go places to watch people and I don't feel like I've been to church unless I've gotten a chance to, to talk. There might be another underlying problem behind that, but we'll talk about that later. Um, <clears throat> But you see, everybody, we express differently, but we need to provide the opportunity to do that. So you've got salvation, and I'm putting that over here for the time being. You've got stability, you've got support, you've got self-expression. And the last S that's important is significance. People have got to feel there's value to their life. Why am I here? Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. And if you think about Ecclesiastes, the book is interesting um, because it's, I kind of take it as it's an expression of a person going through a midlife crisis. It's a person who's writing about what is my purpose, what is my significance, 
Is it simply to eat, drink, and be merry, and then to die? You know, that's kind of a tagline you find in the book. A 21st version, 21st century version of that is to eat, drink, be merry, make money, retire to Florida, you know, Arizona, Texas, maybe to the mountains, maybe to the beach, and then die. But is that all there is to life? And so the writer is actually kind of going through this process. I think he's evaluating his significance. We all want to look back on our life and say, I had meaning, I had value, I contributed, my life means something, I'm of worth. And if that's not uncovered, we have some serious insecurity problems. We have some serious frustration problems. We have some serious boredom problems, too. Now, here's where the, the sermon gets kind of rocky. <laughs> some of you are thinking, it just now? <laughs> I always thought we were there. Um, but significance is interesting. In my opinion, I, I, think, I think a lot of people are exchanging notoriety for significance. You know that five minutes of fame thing? Social media has kind of created a condition, I think, in our culture today where people have decided if I don't know my life's going to have value, at least I'm going to be famous for a few moments. And they do stupid, ridiculous life-threatening things just to be, you know, just to get views on social media, just to go viral with their website. Oh, well, here's the transition. If as a church, we're going to help people reach the fullness of life, if, at a body, as, if as a body of Christ, we're going to help people attain that, what do we need to do collectively in order to help do that? And I think these five fundamental needs, these five fundamental emotional needs have got to be built into our strategy, into our, our structure, into our programming, as it were, so that we help people achieve those emotional needs. And I'll be honest with you, as I was thinking through it, and this is where I was having problems in my own head, I realized I, I, I've not done a good job, and, and, you know, as a church family, we need to do better. So, Let's put the salvation question aside for just a moment. Let's, let's go back and talk just a moment about support. Uh, how, do we, how do we create an atmosphere of support in our church? And I, I do believe it's an important shift in thinking. Now, most of us have this already, but we need to make sure, we need to understand that one of the things we do as a church, as providing opportunities to meet these needs, we provide a family environment. Um, one of the verses that I gave, uh, Butch, if you could pull it up, Butch, on the screen, it's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, where Paul says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also, and here's the bold statement, members of his household. Members of his household. We are the family of God. Now, I know, I know that many of you, that, that's, that's well within your comfort zone. But we need to really think about that. You and I belong to the family of God because the family of God is going to be with you the rest of your life, the rest of eternity, whether your physical family is or not. And God doesn't call his church to be like a family. God calls his church to be a family, to provide support as a family should. We'll come back to that in a later message. Need support. The need stability. Now, stability is a big one, uh, even though I, I, I didn't spend much time on it. Every time Gallup has a poll, or every time Barna, who's the Christian equivalent of Gallup, has a poll, one of the things that comes out in any kind of society study is there are no absolutes. Today, people don't want absolutes. There's no absolute this, there's no absolute that. There are no boundaries. Everybody just makes their own decision. If it's good for you, then do it. If it's bad for you, then don't do it. If it's good for me, leave me alone. I will do it on my own. It's that kind of stuff, no absolutes. One of the things the church needs to continually do is call out to the fact that there are absolutes. Because if you live in a world with no absolutes, your life, you're asking for anxiety, you're asking for stress. That's what James was saying. This is in James chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Butch, if you could pull that one up. James chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. When you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. In other words, the person who does not have some boundaries, who doesn't have a sure foundation, is adrift and is in danger. Today there are three ways to determine um, your 
your moral center. You can do it externally, you can do it internally, or you can do it eternally. Externally is, what, are, what is everybody saying? Let's poll the crowd. What are they saying on social media? What are all the experts saying? That's the outside source. The inside source, which is the prevalent one, I think, today, is what do I think? This is, what I, this is my opinion. My opinion about God is, this is what I think. That's the internal mechanism. But the one that we want to challenge people and channel people towards is the eternal one. What does God say? Because I know it's Jesus followers to another Jesus follower that many of you feel the same way I do, that without that foundation of Jesus Christ in my life, without that rock, I'm in danger. The world is in danger. Okay. What about self-expression? The Bible teaches you and me that we are a unique bundle of gifts, a unique bundle of abilities, a unique bundle of passions and, and abilities and experiences. The church, we need to provide opportunities for people to express themselves. And if it doesn't happen, then we're going to have frustration. Now, folks, I'm not talking about getting weird. You may think we're past that stage already. But um, what I'm talking about is we need to allow people to worship God the way they want to worship God and the way they feel led to worship God. I know sometimes when people have raised their hands during a praise service, you know, some of the people kind of go, look at him, you know, look at her. Don't do that. Don't do that. If someone says amen or if someone starts clapping or if someone expresses themselves that way, give them the freedom to do that. Let's not be so styed and so rigid in our worship that there's only one way to worship God, and that's my way. That's not of God. That's certainly not of Scripture. It's interesting, they did a survey, 40% of the people working at jobs said they were bored. In the same survey, 25% of teenagers drinking alcohol were drinking alcohol because they were bored. People today need something to express what God has made them to express. And we need to do a better job as a church family of providing those opportunities for people to find, whether it's drama or music, or whether it's whatever it might be. And, I, you know, we need help here. So if you're listening at home or you're listening here today in the building and you can think of some program or something we can do a better job of that, please, we need that self-expression. And finally, significance. Everybody needs a purpose in life. If you are an average American, you're going to live at least 25,550 days. You're going to spend 23 years sleeping, 17 years working, 11 years traveling, 6 years playing, 6 years eating. Some of us, it's a little bit more years than the eating qualification. But my question, is that what's life all about? Is that is what life is all about? Paul says in Philippians, and I'm just going to read, this is the, good, the, the uh, New English Bible. I love this translation. This is Philippians 2.13. For it is God who works in you, inspiring both the will and the deeds for his own chosen purpose. God has a purpose for your life. One of the greatest things as a church that we can do is help people find that purpose and challenge that channel that purpose to accomplish God's stuff. Well, I want to conclude with uh, some implications that I've been thinking about. And you can add your own list of implications. Implication number one, since people matter to God and he's called us to be a family, you know, it's interesting, when I was in Sunday school, when I was growing up, I didn't go back to Sunday school every Sunday because I was thrilled with the lessons they were teaching. I went back because my friends were there. When I got into youth group, but I didn't go to youth group because my parents made me, because they didn't. I didn't go because the lessons were awesome. They were some interesting ones. But I went there because my friends were there. Now here's my contention. I think what's true in Bible school, I think what's true as a child, as a youth, is also true as an adult. We have to intentionally plan for opportunities for adults to build relationships. Every small church in America thinks it's a friendly church. Every small church in America sometimes even says in the marquee, a friendly church. And they are to each other. But not to strangers. Not to guests. Not to people that may dress a little different, look a little different, act a little different. So how are we doing? And that also tells me this, 
The church exists for people. People do not exist for the church. Now let me say that again. The church exists for people. People don't exist for the church. The body of Christ is here to give itself away. And I also know in every small church in America, especially after the virus and all the economic things that have happened over the last few years, they're always afraid of closing. They're always afraid, you know, we're going to close if we don't get more money. We're going to close if we don't get this. We're going to close if we don't get that. And, and unfortunately, there's some truth in that. But if that's all we're afraid of, then I think we've missed the boat. Because people, if you think about the scriptures, if you think about the great men and women of God that were used by, like the Apostle Paul, like the Apostle Peter, if you think about James, if you think about some of the Old Testament saints that were so instrumental in, in what happened, their primary goal was not to survive. Their primary goal was to make God look better. And we don't have to survive. We don't have to survive. We just have to be faithful. God doesn't call us to survival. He calls us to faithfulness. So our goal should be to help people to find a full life. And I know from that point to this point, there was some muddled stuff in the middle. But I think those five needs, as we try to develop our strategy around them, we certainly salvation, support, stability, self-expression and significance and you might call them some different things those will help us to accomplish god's goal through christ jesus in the world today to be christ's presence to be his hands and feet so i don't have to survive you don't have to survive we just have to be faithful pray with me father it's it's an awkward kind of thing because I, I know that uh, so many things are going through my head, some things I'd like to see us develop, some things I'd like to see as a church family change, some things I'd like to see us do better at, some things I think we need to drop. But those are just programming things. At the heart of this is the understanding as a family, as a body of Christ, as, as Jesus followers in this place, that our ultimate goal should be your goal, not to make us look good, not to make the preacher look good, the elders look good, anyone look good, but to make you look good and to accomplish what you have us to accomplish in this place. This church has 70-some years of experience, and I believe it's not done yet, but it's not because of me, it's because of you. It's because of what you've done and what you continue to call us to be. So help us to realize it's not about survival. It's about helping people reach the fullness of their life. And in the process, we'll learn what that fullness is for each of us as well. Thank you, Jesus. You get all the glory. We ask this in your name. Amen. I'm going to ask Marilyn to make her way to the piano. Well, I, I do believe that salvation is, is the key. And um, it's the start of everything. And so if that isn't in your life or those watching at home if you've not made Jesus the Lord of your life it's hard to do any of the other things that we've talked about I mean you can but I don't think you can do them as successful salvation is the starting that's the foundation that's the beginning point of saying yes to Jesus yes to the Lord in your life and so we're going to offer up a simple invitation this this chorus I remember singing years ago in almost every church I've ministered at because it simply expresses as simply as can, the thankfulness that we have for what Jesus Christ has done. The title of the song is I Love You, Lord. And if you need to make a decision for Jesus public today, I, you can talk to me after service. If you're online and you're watching and you have some questions, please let me know. Contact me. We'll continue this dialogue either through in person or on phone or through uh, email, whatever, because I believe with all my heart this is the most important decision that you can make. Jesus as your Lord. And so though most of us here today are Jesus followers, I hope you'll sing this song as an expression of your devotion to him.
So I'm going to invite you to stand with me, and we're going to sing twice through, I love you, Lord. seated. Okay, we're going to uh, offer communion now. Uh, those at home, I hope you have your communion supplies ready. Uh, we're going to sing um, in preparation for our time together. Yeah, 349, I haven't been mentioning the hymn names, uh, hymn number 349, if you have access to a hymnal. This is just, again, another simple chorus. Um, oh, how he loves you and me. And we're going to sing both stanzas. And then after that, um, Ernesto's going to come and he's going to offer up a communion meditation. He'll have prayer and then that prayer will be our closing prayer this morning. So let's do, Oh, How He Loves You and Me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life, what more could he give? Oh, how he loves you, oh, how he loves me, oh, how he loves you and me. Jesus to Calvary did go, his love for sinners to show, what he did there. Good morning, brethren. Today's uh, meditation for the Lord's table will be in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. Now take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Sometimes um, we have a hard time understanding God's word. The Bible is a supernatural book, and therefore we need supernatural aid. We say, how can one personality enter into another? The answer is we just don't know. Only God can make that happen. Why is the heart of man compared to a stone at all? Is it because a stone is dead? No feeling? No bleeding? Too hard, you can't cut it. Stab it, nothing happens. Can't put a smile on it. You are dead in the trespasses and sin. Man's heart is like stone. 
because it cannot easily be softened. Preach damnation to it. Won't fear it. What is meant by a heart of flesh? It means a heart that can account for sin. A heart impressed when the gospel is heard. A heart that is warming. A heart that can think. A heart that can aspire. A heart that can love. Putting it all in one heart of flesh, that's a new heart and the right spirit which God gives <clears throat> to regenerate. Men have lost their stony heart, are afraid of sin. Temptation is enough for him, and they flee to the shepherd. A soft heart is the best defense against sin, preparing up for heaven. No repairing your heart. See, God has given you a new heart. But a near approach to understanding may be of a simple analogy borrowed from an old devotional writer several hundred years ago. He says, you have coals that are warm, and you insert a rod in it. Once you start fanning the coals, it becomes hot. And soon the rod is red hot also. So you have coal in the rod, and you have the rod in the coals. Now each is still separate from each other, but both have impregnated each other. You will have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. But now the flesh is not hard, it's more manageable. Because of this, we can come before this table. We can partake of a newness in the heart which is acceptable to the Father. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for this new heart that you have given us. We look forward, Father, to being of you completely, Father, with the heart that you'll give us that is all be for you. Sin will be left out of the picture. We will have a newness of heart, a newness in our bodies, in our spirit. At this table, Father, we, we come before you, you drain it with this newness, Father, that our sin has been taken away. We thank you, Father, for this, and we give you all the honor and glory. For we thank you in Christ's name. Amen.